Buonasera. Let me start with uh, some words uh, in, uh, in Italian. Uh, mio nome è Massimo Sarti, sono il vice direttore dell'Istituto Italiano di Cultura di New York. E, signore e signori che ci state seguendo, che state seguendo questa diretta sul nostro canale eh, YouTube, benvenuti, anche se virtualmente, all'Istituto Italiano di Cultura per questa speciale preview dell'opera The Garden of the Finzi Continuis, la cui produzione è frutto della collaborazione fra il National Yiddish Theatre Folkspin e la New York City Opera. We are very pleased to host this uh, special event and I would like to thank National Yiddish Theatre Folkspin and the New York City Opera for having chosen to present a preview of the opera The Garden of Finzi Continuis at our institute in this initiative organized by the Consulate General of Italy and the, the Italian Cultural Institute. Giorgio Bassani's novel, published in 1962, has over time become a classic of Italian literature and an immediate international success, with translations in numerous languages, most recently Turkish and Chinese, the first, actually the first American uh, edition was published in 1965. And as many people know, The Garden of the Finzi Continuis was adapted for the cinema in a film directed by Vittorio De Sica in 1970. The movie was uh, very well received by the public and won the Academy Award for Best Foreign Language Film and the Golden Bear at the Berlin Festival. In Italy, the novel had uh, other adaptations, a popular one for radio with uh, the actor Sandro Lombardi that uh, many of you are familiar with him, and more recently an audio book uh, read by Marco Baliani. But today, Bassani masterpiece is enriched by a new form of adapta adaptation and the story of the Finzi Continuis a noble family of Ferrara during the Jewish persecution in Italy in the third in 1930s becomes an opera that uh, the public can appreciate in its entirety from January 27, the date of the International Holocaust Remembrance Day. We are very pleased to have uh, with us tonight the general director of the New York City Opera, Michael Capasso, the composer of the opera, Ricky Jan Gordon, and the librettist, uh, Michael Corey, as well as part uh, of the cast, the singers, uh, Tatev Baroyan and Jeremy Browner, and the pianist, Catherine uh, Olander, who will allow us uh, to enter into, into the production of uh, The Garden of the Finzi Continuis. But before uh, giving them the floor, I would like to invite the Consul General of Italy, Fabrizio Michele, Di Michele, to the podium for his greeting. Grazie. Uh, thank you very much. Thank you all. I don't want to take time. I think uh, people are here to, to look, to watch uh, this preview. I'm myself looking forward to it. Uh, I don't want to repeat the Thanks for um, all the people who are here and made possible this preview. We strongly wanted to have this preview, um, and despite all the restrictions imposed upon us uh, by COVID-19, it's important that we can show it uh, with live streaming and will be also available in the website of the Cultural Institute uh, afterwards. Uh, what I want to stress uh, is not only the importance uh, of uh, the novel Giardino Finzi Contini in Italy that uh, um, Massimo Sarti already did, uh, but uh, the fact that we have a new American opera now reinterpreting uh, this famous novel, and uh, we already know that uh, there, is a, there are plans to bring to Italy an Italian version of this opera. So it's a way uh, again uh, to renew uh, uh, the, uh, the 
knowledge of a very famous writer, Giorgio Bassani, and a very famous uh, novel um, in Italy. But for us here in New York, it's also particularly uh, important because we are approaching the International um, Holocaust Remembrance Day, and uh, we are part of a very important commemoration every year the Consulate General, the Cultural Institute, the Center Primo Levi, and many other cultural institutions of new Italian cultural institutions of New York. Uh, it's the way we commemorate the Giorno della Memoria. And this is done through a series of uh, events, uh, and, and seminars, uh, workshops, that unfortunately will be online this year, like uh, last year. But uh, on the 27th, uh, we will go back to an in-presence event for the ceremony of the reading of all the names of the Italian Jews deported during the Second World War. Uh, and uh, this is an event now has become a kind of a big event in New York for the past 20 years, which uh, sees the involvement of all different uh, association organizations, the municipality and other diplomatic and consular representations. And uh, uh, as I said, this became a particularly important uh, um, event for the Consulate General. Uh, so I like to think of this preview as part of our program for this year uh, Journal de la Memoria celebrations. And with this, I'd like to, to give the floor to uh, my friend Michael Capasso, the Director General of the New York City Opera. Grazie, Consule. Thank you, everyone. Um, it is a great pleasure and, a, and an honor to be here. Um, New York City Opera has a great history uh, of pr presenting and premiering New American Opera uh, for decades. And um, in my administration already, we have had several premieres. Uh, this one is very near and dear to my heart because, of course, it's an Italian subject matter. It's a a book and a film that I was familiar with when I was, was very young. I remember going to see it in a very large movie theater, which they don't have anymore. Um, and I remember then, after seeing the movie, being interested and then reading the book, uh, which is a great classic. And uh, the opera was brought to my attention by two of my colleagues who are friends who we have uh, known before, um, Ricky Ian Gordon, the composer, and Michael Corey, the librettist. Ricky is unable to be with us tonight. Uh, he has another opera premiering at the same time called Intimate Apparel at Lincoln Center. Uh, so he's there. But uh, Michael Corey is with us tonight, and you'll get to meet and, and hear from him as well. We also have brought two members of the cast. Our principal cast is resting because we've been rehearsing frantically. Two days ago, we were rehearsing in a studio that ran out of heat. And we thought we needed to just change to La Boheme for one day and because we were freezing. Uh, but instead, we, uh, we moved through, and we are now moved into the theater, which is within the Museum of Jewish Heritage. Um, and our partners, the National Yiddish Theater Volksbina, uh, we're moving ahead with beginning technical rehearsals and moving toward a premiere on January 27th, which is National, International Holocaust Remembrance Day, a very significant date for all of us involved, as the Consul said. Um, I'd like to introduce to you uh, our, some excerpts, and I'll set them up for you. Uh, then you'll get to hear two of our wonderful singers from the company, uh, accompanied by our principal pianist and coach, Catherine Olander. Uh, the first aria you're going to hear, the opera begins in Ferrara in 1955, when Giorgio, having lived in America and escaped the Holocaust, returns to the synagogue in Ferrara, which is a very solemn place. And he encounters uh, a man whose name is Perotti, who was the caretaker for the Finzi Contini family. And the Finzi Contini family, of course, have all perished as has Mikol, which was the great love of his life when he was young, unrequited love of his life, I will add. Um, and he sings of uh, his remembranza of the time. 
and, and he's, um, he, it's a prologue that will lead us back to the 30s and the events that transpire. And the opera is bookend with a prologue and an epilogue which involve the character of Giorgio, the leading tenor, in the synagogue. So I would like to introduce tenor Jeremy Broner and our accompanist, Catherine Olander, to give you the opening aria from the Garden of the Finzi Contini. Thank you.
Um, the score to this opera, while written <laughs> very recently, is quite melodic and quite beautiful and meant to evoke the period of, from which it you know, takes place. And that's something that we're very excited about. These uh, creators have, have really come upon something amazing. So um, as the story progresses, we arrive in Ferrara, um, and um, young Giorgio and young Nicole meet for the first time as she is peering over the wall of her garden. And the, the story advances to them as adults, or um, after, at the time they're in university. And um, the middle class Jews, because of the uh, racial laws that have been instituted by Mussolini, are, ev are, are no longer welcome to play tennis in the tennis club. And so the Finzi Contini invite them to use their tennis court and play on their tennis court and enjoy refreshments inside the garden, which is someplace that no one has ever seen before other than the immediate family. It's, it's a myth in Ferrara, this garden of the Finzi Contini. But um, Hermano has, uh, Finzi Contini has opened it up. Uh, he's, a, he's a generous man. Um, He's not necessarily admired by the Jewish community, even though he rebuilt the synagogue for them because he's referred to as a high holy day Jew. And uh, the, Finzi, the Giorgio's family says, you know, we walk to shul, they take a limousine. They're very, very different people. They're not really like us. Nevertheless, um, we are invited into the tennis court. We see a tennis match, be, and Nicole and Giorgio uh, are now together again after having had this flirtation when they were very young, when they were just teenagers. And there is a scene now that you're going to hear which is called a walk in the garden. And, and they are within the garden and everybody, the tennis players have left and Nicole asked Giorgio to stay behind so they can walk. And she sings and he's very, he's surprised because the garden is not a garden. There are no flowers, there are only trees. And she says, these trees have been here for centuries. These trees were here when Lucrezia Borgia was here. It's very important. It's where the strength of our family comes from. And of course, Giorgio is completely smitten and desperately in love with Nicole. And Nicole loves him, unfortunately for him, only as a friend. Yet they share very, very beautiful, tender moments. Here you will hear Jeremy again, this time with the lovely young soprano, Tatev Barayan. And again, Catherine Olander, this is the duet, A Walk in the Garden.
creature there would be well, millions and millions of flowers. Oh, flowers go, flowers go next to say a tree. What can a flowers be? Austerity. Did I say the wrong thing? I truly beg your pardon. These really old trees happen to be the heart and soul of the garden of the physical day. And as I said, they're utterly Chanting. Please, you couldn't tell a pear from a plum tree. Instruct me. These old trees have been living here for centuries. Oh, 
Thank you. Uh, next, I would like to introduce our creators. Uh, as I said, our composer Ricky Ian Gordon is unable to be here, but we have a video message from him that we're going to share, and then you'll get to meet Mr. Michael Corey live and in person. Uh, and there will still be one more musical excerpt before all is over. Uh, thank you again for being here. This is the New York City Opera and the National Yiddish Theater's production of The Garden of the Finzi Contini, premiering on January 27th. I wish I could be with you tonight, but I am hearing the orchestrations for the first time, which is very important. So forgive me for not being with you, but I thought I would just tell you rather quickly how the whole idea of this being an opera came about. And it starts when I am a 15-year-old boy living in Island Park, Long Island, which is the town before Long Beach, and I am obsessed with with foreign film. I know every movie by Bergman, Antonioni, Fellini, Truffaut, Kurosawa, and I see that De Sica has a new movie, the great De Sica who made The Bicycle Thief. And I take a train to East Rockaway and I see the movie, The Garden of the Fiends and Continues. And it has a profound effect on me, but I'm too young to understand it. But for some reason, about every five years, I just watch that movie again. And each time I watch it, something new is sort of touched in me until Michael Corey and I write a big opera of The Grapes of Wrath in 2007. And it's, it's a triumph. It's a huge triumph. And we're looking for our next piece. And... I'm walking home one night on 72nd Street and I decide to rent that movie again, The Garden of the Fiends It Continues, because I wonder if my partner Kevin has ever seen it. And I bring it home and we watch it and I have a reaction to the movie that I had never had before, which was sort of hysteria. I was inconsolable. I've thought a lot about it and why did I have that reaction to it then? And I realized we bring whatever we have gained as human beings in terms of experience to uh, a movie we see again or a book we read again. By the time I watched that movie again, first of all, in the dead center of my life was the AIDS crisis. And by 2008, I had lost a partner, my mother, two sisters, my father. I knew grief in a way I had never known grief before. And in a way, this story is suffused with grief. It is also suffused with unrequited love, with an aching yearning for something you can have. And meanwhile, what I never got before was I was either into one story, Giorgio loving McCall, or the Holocaust story, but suddenly I saw the two stories intertwine. And the idea of this backstory of catastrophe that is happening alongside this story of such a deep aching yearning. And for some reason, it really hit me that night. 
and I'm sure Michael Corey will talk more about this, but obviously, as we were writing the opera, this story has enormous resonance now. There was just on NPR two mornings ago a whole piece about the rise of anti-Semitism and the rise of violent anti-Semitic incidents all over the world. There is suddenly a government, or there is an urge, shall we say, towards autocracy in this country. And it is possible to imagine something as awful as the Manifesto della Razza, the racial laws that, that um, Mussolini enacted. So the, everything about this story and our writing in opera seems all along to have made sense. And it makes sense to me that I saw this movie out of it. And I should let the other guys take it away, but that sort of, that was the impetus. That was the impetus to make this incredible, um, and by the way, it was Michael's idea that we adapt the novel because the movie is so reliant on upon the beautiful and quiet imagery, but the novel fills out the people so they have something to sing about. But I'm sure there's more I could say, but I just, that, that's sort of my introduction to how this beautiful story became our opera, an opera that we have both decided to dedicate to our fathers. Hi, everybody. I wish I could be with you tonight, but I am hearing the orchestrations for the first time. Ricky and Gordon, um, very, very interesting, uh, his take on it. Um, I would like to, um, I'm going to tell you a, a, a little story, and then I'm going to introduce Michael Corey. Um, New York City Opera produced uh, an opera prior at the National Yiddish Theater, which was another world premiere called Dear Eric, which took place in the Holocaust. Um, it was very moving, very wonderful, and our partnership with the National Yiddish Theater developed. And I had a pre-existing, I met with the people at the Yiddish Theater and they said, if you could come up with another opera that had a Holocaust theme, we'd love to partner on it. And as it happened the next day, I had a pre-existing appointment with Michael Corey. And he came into my office with a score of the Garden of the Finzi Contini under his arm. And I said, we're doing an opera. Ladies and gentlemen, Mr. Michael Corey. Hello. Well, um, I'm here to tell you a little bit about how we made it into an opera. Um, as you heard from the gentleman who spoke before, it's a, a world classic, this novel. It's been an Academy Award winning film. Uh, it's been a radio play. Um, I'm not sure anyone ever envisioned it as an opera, but uh, when Ricky proposed it to me, I remembered it. I went and read the novel. Uh, two different translations, and I said, yes, this would work. Um, I'll just tell you a little bit about how Ricky and I work. We both come from theater backgrounds. We're not academics. I'm not a noted poet who writes a libretto and slips it under the door and shows up on opening night. We are very what they call process-oriented, and luckily, Ricky lives on West 70th Street, and I live on West 71st Street. He wakes up at 5 in the morning, write something that he falls in love with because he's the kind of composer that always falls in love with the latest thing that he wrote, calls me up at 7 and says, come over and listen to this. Um, I say, it's 7 o'clock in the morning. I'm not showered. I'm shaved. He says, just come. I'll make coffee. Um, and uh, that's what we do. And we work every single moment of the opera together. Um, and then we change it, uh, re-change it, and... Uh, 
we adjusted our conception of this when we knew we were going to be doing it for the New York City Opera and the folks Bina. Um, and uh, I'm just delighted that it's gonna have its premiere here in New York City. Um, one thing that I particularly loved about this as an opera, well, first of all, to make it an opera, in a film you can show an image of a desiccated tennis court at the very end and you get a whole realization of what happened to this culture. But you can't just show an image in an opera. Or in a novel, you have the authorial voice to describe things in prose. But you can't just lift out the little bits of dialogue because very often they're like, yes, I agree, or something like that. It's all in the novelist's voice. So you have to, you have to um, understand what the novelist is trying to say in prose and turn that into singable dialogue. You have to keep in mind what the architecture of an opera is like. Um, I always contrast an opera to a musical. Uh, if a musical is like a cardiogram with ups and downs uh, and peaks of energy, an opera to me is more like going up the ascent of a roller coaster. It's constant, constant build until you reach a climax and then uh, a conflict and then you have your act. Um, so we kept on, what I, that's what I call musical geography. So that was one thing we kept in mind. Another thing that uh, I kept in mind was that this was a semi-autobiographical novel. Um, uh, the opening segment that you heard sung uh, involves Giorgio coming back to Italy after the war. He is the one member of his family who escaped. And uh, it's in 1955, and he comes back to the synagogue of his youth, and it's ruined. It's been bombed out. Um, and he sings about memory. Um, and he's looking to the past to answer the conflicts that he still has. Um, and as he sings, that bombed, ruined synagogue comes back to life. I think he says, through the eaves, a, a world of secret uh, something's praise. And we, we come back to his uh, synagogue as it was when he was age 15. And uh, it's a high holiday. The Rosh Hashanah and the whole congregation is there praying. And that's when he first falls in love with Nicole Finzi Contini, who's sitting in the men's section with her father, because she's entitled, peeking at him through the fringes of her father's talus, uh, the prayer shawl. That's a very important image. Anyway, um, it was semi-autobiographical, um, but in the time it was written, I think he was writing it for people who had lived through World War II and understood what was going to happen to these people. And we're premiering it here in America where we don't really remember what happened yesterday. Uh, that happens to be our national fault. Um, and we know very little about World War II from the perspective of what happened in Italy. So I felt that what was implied in the novel had to be brought forth and dramatized. So for instance, we heard that rights were being taken away. So I found the actual document where those rights were taken away, the Manifesta della Razza. And we dramatize it. We see the father going to the bank and being told, no, you can't bank here anymore. Or the son going to the library and said, no, your library card is revoked. Uh, and the mother being told by her servants they have to leave because uh, non-Jews cannot be employed by Jews anymore. And Giorgio being denied the right to play with his friends at the public tennis court. That's the whole fulcrum on which the story hinges. Because of the denial of their rights, their slow revocation of Italian citizenship, which paved the way for them to be deported, that's what made the Finzi Contini's come down off their high pedestal and condescend to invite the everyday people to their wonderful estate to play tennis. And playing tennis behind this garden wall while the world is changing around them seemed like such an apt metaphor for what's going on here. Um, what are we doing while the world is changing around us? We're noticing it and we're choosing not to. Um, Another thing that I wanted to deal with was uh, language. I wanted to use Italian language, and Michael encouraged me to use Italian language. I wanted to give it verisimilitude, but I also wanted to mix it with English, and I also wanted to use Hebrew. 
And uh, the Hebrew that the Italians speak is different than the Hebrew that either the Ashkenazis or the Sephardic speak. And so we had to research that. I actually spoke to um, that wonderful judge who's a descendant of the Fincy Contini's living in uh, New Haven these days um, and talked about the language that was spoken then. And then there was the middle class Jews and the high class Jews and the foods they eat. I, I was a journalist and I love to find all of these facts and layer them in. And that is what I think I added to the novel, things that would help make it accessible to modern audiences who had not lived through the period. Um, I think it's particularly relevant now, uh, this libretto and opera, having gone through the pandemic, having watched this conflict between science and nonsense on the internet, um, the sort of degradation of fact. Um, this was what was going on there. Um, and. Uh, the growth of anti-Semitism, um, the, the comparisons of Mussolini and Trump. Uh, I, I mean that all to be very much felt by the audience, but I believe the audience will come in s figuring, I'm seeing a historical work that's set in Italy during World War II. And then slowly they realize, oh my God, time is repeating itself, it's happening right now. And I love that because I am a journalist and I call that a stealth opera where suddenly the audience realizes it's about that but it's about you right now. And that connection to me is very important. Um, ultimately, I think that the piece is about, is Pisani's warning about the danger of sentimentalizing the past and memory. Memory is a two-edged sword. And the piece begins in this bombed out synagogue, it comes back to life, and it ends in the bombed out synagogue where he recalls everything that happened now, but it has not brought him relief or satisfaction. He has to live with it. Um, and uh, the rest, I hope you'll all come see for yourself. And. Uh, I love working with Ricky because it is such a back and forth kind of collaboration and we're very privileged to have such a wonderful cast and orchestra and production. Thank you, Michael. Um, it's amazing to, to the, the process that we're going through to create this opera. <clears throat> the close connection with, uh, with the creators makes a big difference. I, I want to mention that um, I'm very close to this piece for a number of reasons. And I chose a, uh, I feel necessary to discuss that, I chose a director who's a wonderful, incredibly creative man who um, had to ultimately, after three rehearsals, withdraw for very personal reasons that I understood completely. And so I personally took over the direction of the opera. But it still was conceived and created by him, so I'm trying to put his vision very, very much on stage. And, and but, you know, as I do from time to time, I, you know, I capasso it up with, you know, what I do, because that's what I do. I mean, I've directed hundreds of operas. Um, this past summer, with our set designer, I went to Ferrara, and we spent two weeks in Ferrara. We met with the, um, the director, uh, Ar uh, Amadeo Spagnolotto of the uh, Meis, which is the National Museum in Italy of, of, of Jewish culture. And <coughs> he was incredibly gracious and gave us unprecedented um, access to Jewish life and historic Jewish life in Ferrara including access to the synagogue. Um, the synagogue is, is mostly closed because it suffered tremendous damage in an earthquake. But what I found out were there were three, there were three temples within the one building. One of them was for Ashkenazi Jews, and there was a very small one for Sephardic Jews, and then the larger one was for Italian Jews. And they, all three, 
had slightly different ritual, slightly different music. Um, the leader of the Jewish community brought us around. We went to all of the important points. We went to the cemetery. We went to all of the important Bassani points, etc., cetera, and um, were, were fascinated by the fact that Bassani created an image of, of where the, the Finzi Contini estate was, and it was actually in the novel outside of the wall. Um, and, but our designer was still able to ride the path uh, on a bicycle with a camera so that when we have the, 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 the people riding to the Finzi Contini estate, they're riding under the very trees in Ferrara that Bassani rode under. The images of the synagogue that we have in the production are images of the actual synagogue. The alleyways of Ferrara have not changed. They look what they looked like in the 30s. And so it's remarkable. The, the, the physical production is highly video driven because there are dozens of locations. And we had to be, you know, in order to create that, we had to create something that is slightly cinematic, in fact, yet is not, uh, is not adapted from the, from the film in any way whatsoever. Uh, but our design team has created something that, uh, so that, so that when they are on bicycles and they are pedaling, this video of actual trees of Ferrara are moving behind them. When we return to the synagogue, we're in the real synagogue. When we're in front of the school, we're in front of the actual school. <clears throat> and of course, there's this incredibly moving, you know, we, we went to where the gate of the ghetto was and learned many, many details, including the fact that the Jews that lived in the ghetto only had windows facing the ghetto. There were no windows that faced the rest of Ferrara. They weren't allowed to look out at the rest of Ferrara. They could only, they could only stay within their, within their group. Um, I then had the privilege to go back to Ferrara again, um, and I did meet, um, I did meet a, a wonderful man named Andrea Pesaro. And Andrea Pesaro is a, a descendant and lives in the home that Bassani visited as a, as a young man and, and has the tennis court that was the tennis court. Um, interestingly, uh, the family, they are not fans of Bassani because they felt that they were gracious and they allowed him and his friends into their world. And in the end, he wrote this novel that was not necessarily complimentary. So the result is that we have lots of interesting stories and video and photographs that we can't use. But <laughs> nevertheless, we have wonderful, wonderful content. and. Um, really did, uh, you know, we partnered now with Mayis. They are an important part of our production. Uh, whenever I need information about, you know, an Italian Passover Seder versus, you know, I grew up on Long Island. I went to hundreds of Passover Seders. I was 21 before I figured out I wasn't Jewish. You know, it's so, I understand, but I understand American Ashkenazi Jews on Long Island. I, the Italian ritual is different. And so we had to learn about that and try and adapt to that. Um, <clears throat> we're going to have one more musical excerpt, and then we'll have a little bit of time for some questions, should anybody have them, whether in the room, I don't know if we're able to take questions on YouTube, but uh, you're going to hear an excerpt from um, Mikol's aria, sung by Tatev, and it, it begins with, we can never be together, and it's after a tremendous conflict between Giorgio and Mikol. Giorgio has adored Nicole from the minute he laid eyes on her and has pursued her throughout the opera and she loves him as a friend and rejects him and he's heartbroken and he'll never be the same and frankly I think that's why he leaves and goes to America because he can't stay in Ferrara anymore and, and, and Nicole is a, you know, she's the Finzi Contini princess and she has, um, she, she likes Giorgio, but she also is, she has a heart that is a little on the rough side. She does, never opens up to him. And ultimately, there are circumstances in the opera that are dramatic that do not present her in the most beautiful light. Uh, but this is an, an aria that she sings after she rejects Giorgio and Giorgio leaves. 
um, where we can never be together and it's never going to happen and um, it's, it's, it's very painful. It's a moment that when I was directing the scene I said, imagine I got to walk in the park with Penelope Cruz and she told me she liked me as a friend. I'd be very upset. Anyway, here we go. This is Tatev again, the aria from the second act, We Shall Never Be Together. Well, that, uh, that ends our musical excerpts. Uh, we, we can take some questions for, for me or for Michael um, and for, or even the, the singers, if you, if you like, for some reason, if there's something that you'd like to know um, about the production, other than that it opens on January 27th for eight performances at the Museum of Jewish Heritage um, in partnership with the National um, Yiddish Theater Folks Bina. You can go to either of our websites and find out how to get tickets. We encourage everybody to come. It's a limited run. We expect that it's going to sell out, um, and we hope it sells out, certainly. Um, but we would like to encourage all of you to, to possibly come and, and join us and support live theater in a time where things are closing left and right. We have been extremely careful, um, and we are forging ahead with this production and under endless COVID protocols and issues going on and on and on, yet we, we are committed to it. We feel it's a very important, it's very important for, for the world to get out 
and, and, and celebrate music and celebrate something wonderful like this. So I thank you in advance for all of that, and um, I would open the floor to any questions, if there are, from anyone on, on, on the stream or live. <coughs> no questions. Not even, like, what's the capital of Albania? Nothing like that? <laughs> yes. Wonderful, thank you. Yes, when I, uh, the, my last trip to Italy, um, I, we have uh, partners uh, that we have worked with in the past uh, in, in Verona and Genoa. And in particular in Genoa, uh, we have a very close connection because the sovrintendente there was, used to be in Cagliari, and now he moved to, to Genoa. And uh, we have a, we've done two co-productions already together with him, so it's my, he's my closest ally, I suppose you could say, in Italy. And I think the idea is to ultimately translate it into Italian and bring it to Italian theaters where there is a tremendous appetite for this story, because it's known to everyone, everywhere. And, uh, and, it's, and it's very, very, you know, as you can hear, the music is very beautiful and, and very Italian. Anyone else? Yes? No? Basta così. Okay. Thank you all very, very much. Um, we really appreciate your being here. Um, we are thrilled, once again, to collaborate with the Consul General and the Vice Council and the Italian Cultural Institute on anything we possibly can. My special thanks to Michael Corey for making the trip and to Ricky Ian Gordon for recording. And of course, my artists, please come out and take a bow one more time. I don't, they're not, they're, they're not here, but they, I, they're probably changing. Anyway, uh, thank you again. All of you, I encourage you to try and see the opera. I encourage you to go see any opera. Just go to the opera. It's good for the soul. Thank you very much and have a good night.